morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, an event this morning to talk about a uh, presentation of a, of a new ebook. That's the new thing, I think. I, I don't know why I buy a publishing book. It's just like so fascinating. It's like the ebook is the way to go. You get a lot more attention than all. Uh, in this case, it's deserved attention. So uh, we're going to talk. I, I will um, introduce our, our two authors here in a minute, and, uh, and then uh, Blair Rubin is, is, is going to be the respondent. Uh, typically, we will, as, as, as always, end at 10.30, if not before. Just a couple quick things. Uh, advertisements on Thursday, the 25th, we're having an event here. Uh, what's on the agenda for the next FCC? And Blair's going to be speaking at that as well. Um, there's another event, which we just finalized last night, so I have no idea. I can't even remember the date, but it's on our website. The, wait, do you know that, that ISOC? 26th. 26th, the next day. Yeah. All right, so another event. Well, I'm going to... Uh, the Internet Society uh, is having an event, that, which they're hosting here, uh, on uh, sort of broadband, uh, uh, where we are, and all that stuff. Okay, so uh, let me start with introductions. Uh, I'll start immediately at uh, my left. Bob Lighton uh, should really deserve no introduction, because uh, everybody knows uh, his, his excellent work. He's now Vice President, uh, sorry, Director of Research at Bloomberg Government, and uh, uh, took the long commute, I think, up today from the fifth floor to the sixth floor. Uh, of course, he was vice president of um, research and policy at the Kauffman Foundation, and it was really Bob's leadership at Kauffman that, that, that took Kauffman to really be this globally prominent uh, enterprise uh, and foundation in spurring uh, entrepreneurship policy and entrepreneurship awareness. Uh, so he left that, came to, came to Brookings. I came to uh, uh, Bloomberg, but had prior that was at Brookings. He's been at several law firms, had several... Uh, Prominent positions in government, including associate director of OMB, deputy assistant attorney general uh, at DOJ. He's the uh, author, co-author of 25 books, lots of articles, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, has uh, too many degrees. I think uh, a JD from Yale Law, and also a PhD in economics from from Yale Law. So really a great combination of uh, economics and law. Hal Singer is the Managing Director and Principal of Navigant Economics, which is a consulting firm uh, here in town that focuses on economic policy, particularly related to telecom. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University uh, School of Business, uh, has written extensively on these issues around uh, antitrust finance regulation, uh, recent author of another book, Broadband in Europe, How Brussels Can Wire the Information Society. And he's had articles in multiple uh, prominent journals, uh, magazines, including the Wall Street Journal. And Hal has his PhD in economics from uh, Johns Hopkins. And last but not least, Blair Levin. Uh, Blair currently is a communications and society fellow at the Aspen Institute. Uh, prior to that, he had uh, taken the, the reins of directing the very first national broadband plan, and the best national broadband plan, I think, in the world, uh, and it was really Blair's leadership. I thought you were going to say the best the United States has ever done. It is <laughs> the best <laughs> the United States has ever done. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he oversaw the development of that. Uh, prior to that, he'd been an analyst at Leg Mason and Stiffel Nicholas, and uh, in the 90s was chief of staff, uh, for part of the 90s, uh, chief of staff to FCC chairman Reed Hunt. And he is also a Yale graduate, so we have two Yale graduates here. So we're going to start uh, with, with Bob and Hal talking uh, about their, their book, The Need for Speed, and then Blair will be a respondent, and then we can open up for questions. Uh, thanks. Oh, I guess push it. Push it once. Is it on now? No. no. On now? No. Wait, wait, wait. Turn green. Green, green. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Rob. And, um, I'm assuming I'm speaking to the condescension in this room, so I think I'm going to dramatically shorten um, what I had planned to say um, and go directly to the punchline. Uh, the fact that our book is digital is, I think, a metaphor for why we're all here, um, and it's a metaphor for uh, why we uh, wrote the book. Um, in the days before the Telecom Act, which seemed like a century ago to me, um, and by the way, I should just parenthetically say that my thinking in this whole area has evolved tremendously since I was a justice. I was, I was there in 93, 96, 95. We worked on the Telecom Act. We worked on the breakup of AT and or the, the last vestiges of the breakup of AT&T and whether, um, whether the R-Box should be allowed to go the long distance and whether the telcos should compete with the, you know, 
with video, all that stuff seems so ancient. And what we were obsessed with at the time, just to give you a historical context, is even at that time, uh, I think people thought of the various devices or the pipes for communications as basically siloed and totally separate. So you had a telephone world that was still largely monopolized but gradually deregulating. You had radio and TV, which is completely separate. Um, and satellite was just sort of beginning. Um, and they were all followed in separate universes. Um, and there are still vestiges of this thinking today. But the, what the broadband revolution about, at least in, in hell in my mind, is that um, essentially when everything's a bit, none of these silos make any sense anymore. Um, and so uh, uh, everything's a bit. And then all these different pipes that we have, if we think about the air and we think about wireless, um, uh, and satellite and fixed, whether it's take, uh, telco or cable, they're all means for delivering bits. And so uh, the bottom line is, I mean, we can dispute how much competition there is between them, but, but the direction is clear. All the pipes compete with each other in delivering bits. And so that world that, that I worked in 20 years ago where we were obsessively worried about monopoly, discrimination, all kinds of things, that world is not here anymore. That's the basis of our book. And um, so uh, once, once you accept that, um, then you next ask the question, uh, what should be the principal focus of telecom policy then? Now historically, uh, telecom and the FCC and Blair can, I'm sure, testify to this. The obsession has been, well, let's make sure it's ubiquitous and universal and everybody can get access to it. Um, and in a monopoly world, the way you think about getting people access is you, 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 you regulate the prices. Um, you assure them of profits, um, you put a little tax on, and you use the money, and you have a universal service fund to basically build out um, access for people that are in low-income areas or geographically distant or whatever. Um, but in a world in which you can have a lot more competition, the need for universal service goes down. So for example, when we get to broadband penetration, and what is broadband? Well, the FCC defines it as four megabits download um, as minimally accepted um, definition of broadband. Um, when you look at that, basically uh, virtually 100% of everybody in urban areas has access to minimally accepted broadband, and over 80% of people in rural areas. And so we're down to basically less than 5% of the country that does not have, have access. So that is a problem, and how I think uh, we'll briefly address sort of how to fix that residual problem. But the big picture is, is that, the, that, that that is less of a, of a worry today. What, what we argue should be the central focus of policy going forward is to make sure that, broad, that broadband gets faster and faster, hence the title, Need for Speed. So we want technological change, we want competition, and we want a government that facilitates that. Okay, that's the basic, the basic theory. So um, how, do you, how do you get more competition? Um, well, the first thing you do is you recognize that there's a lot more competition between wireless and fixed than you would have thought maybe five years ago. Um, and I have a feeling this is going to be one of the subjects we're going to get into in Q&A. But I can think of no other way to better del illustrate this um, than the news item that is actually the front page of a section of the Wall Street Journal today that came over our, 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 our wires yesterday at, uh, at Bloomberg, and that is that PC sales fell 14% last quarter. We are in the age of the demise of the PC. Now, uh, Blair and I were talking before, you'll still have PCs. I mean, we'll have them in central locations. We'll have them in, you know, classrooms. We'll have them in, you know, um, uh, a large settings. But increasingly, we're going to a tablet world. And once you go to a tablet world, uh, basically, that means the wireless stuff that you can download on a tablet um, competes increasingly with the fixed stuff that's, you know, in your house. Uh, and especially if we get a convergence of, of TV with Netflix and everything else, you know, we're, we're talking about a world in which wireless and, 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 and wireline are, are strong competitors. And so um, we urge the FCC to adopt that mindset. And one indicator that they haven't adopted it yet, and it's not their fault entirely, is that Congress tells them every year to produce a report on the state of wire, wireless competition, which they just did. And they issue this report, and they show how competitive wireline and, 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 and fixed are. They show that both are up there at 10, 10 megabits. And ITIF produced this report just what, a couple of weeks ago, which, which shows all this. 
Um, and so the people that are really thinking about this, including the FCC indirectly, say that we've had this convergence. And it now really just needs congressional blessing for the FCC to recognize this and to take various regulatory steps to get more wireless spectrum out there and secondly to relax some of the rules that impede uh, the, uh, the wireline guys from competing more heavily with the wireless. And so the one area, actually we, we single out two areas of public policy that need attention and Hal's going to talk to the details about these. Uh, one is in roughly half the country, uh, we, o we still only have one fixed wireline producer or, 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 or our platform. Now it's true you can get wireless in, the, in this half the country, but you still, get, you still got the cable guys and you don't have the telcos. So this is a problem. I mean, it would be nice if we could have a policy environment that would induce the telcos to further increase their investment so that we have the full panoply of competition. And there is substantial economic evidence to show that the more competitors you have, the lower prices, better quality, and all that. So that is one issue. And then the second issue, which Hal's going to talk about, is uh, where you have these single providers and they are vertically integrated, they can engage in discriminatory content. And that is a traditional antitrust problem um, to which there are no remedies. So I'm going to turn it over to Hal to talk about some of our details. I'll turn mine off. There you go. Off of the reference to the news, I think I'm going to follow him. I don't know if uh, anyone heard about this story in Atlanta, a uh, suburb yesterday, but someone uh, faked a, a heart attack so that he could take some firemen hostages with the end goal of demanding free internet service. And I commend everyone to listen to the 911. <laughs> Uh, phone calls because the, the, the poor fireman uh, couldn't remember what the third service was in the triple play. He had to ask the, 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 um, the person who was who, uh, holding a gun to his head, what's the third service? He had telephone service. He wants to have free telephone service as well. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that uh, perhaps we should, we should find out whether um, Susan Crawford's book had anything to do with this. It's, I guess it's not enough that uh, we have free uh, one gigabit uh, internet service up and down, but we also need uh, free telephone service to boot. Um, as I pointed out, uh, our book offers a litany of, of uh, regulatory reforms designed to streamline the FCC to get them to focus on what we think is more important and um, generally to, to curb their discretion. Uh, these reforms are deregulatory. Uh, generally, uh, and they include things such as scaling back the FCC mandates that uh, telcos uniquely have to maintain this uh, legacy copper network, uh, and eliminating the FCC's approval of telecom mergers, but retaining their role as an advisor uh, to the DOJ. In addition, we encourage uh, accelerating the auction of wireless spectrum uh, to enhance what we see as this coming intermodal competition between wireless and wireline broadband. Um, but deregulation is not our entire agenda. There are certain areas, uh, uh, such as police and discriminatory conduct on the internet, uh, where we think the FCC still uh, should have a role. And I want to focus my remarks today on that role. I have three simple points that I want to make. The first is that before uh, the FCC can regulate the internet, including policing discriminatory conduct, um, it's going to need some guidance from Congress. Now, what do I mean by discrimination? Um, I mean treating two similarly situated websites differently due to affiliation. Let me give you an example. This would be a vertically integrated cable operator uh, treating Skype differently than its own affiliated VOIP service, or treating Netflix differently than its own affiliated uh, streaming video service. Now, vertical, uh, vertical integration uh, into content and applications uh, gives cable modem providers, not just cable, any network operator, an incentive to discriminate against websites that threaten their affiliated services. Uh, the potential harm is that if we allow vertically integrated <coughs> um, network owners uh, to discriminate with impunity, we will get fewer choices in the short term and potentially uh, less innovation in the long term, as independents uh, could be discouraged from risk taking. Uh, or simply unwilling to surrender their sweat equity to the network owner in exchange for getting access to its customers. And the FCC has limited authority <coughs> to regulate information services. That's uh, 
highlighted through Verizon's challenge to the FCC's open internet order and uh, the DC Circuit's decision in BitTorrent. And on the other hand, reclassifying the internet as a telecom service, as some suggest, is really a non-starter politically. Um, and uh, the idea of imposing mandatory unbundling on, on network operators is fantastic in light of the fact that there are so many choices for internet access. So it seems like we need a compromise that would empower the FCC to police discrimination in a limited, after-the-fact way, but would not be so offensive to conservatives or free market types uh, so as to guarantee a fight. Finally, the notion that's advanced by some people um, in the free market crowd that discrimination complaints can be taken care of in an antitrust setting uh, or that discrimination is only offensive if it generates price effects is simply wrong. We don't give uh, employers a license to discriminate against minorities so long as there isn't a wage effect. Um, discrimination is offensive because, uh, not because it generates short-term price effects, but because it denies otherwise qualified applicants, or in this case, independent content providers, an equal shot at success. <clears throat> My second point is that the non-discrimination rules should permit contracting for priority delivery, but should narrowly prevent preferential treatment based on affiliation. Now, this is not the compromise that was struck. There was no compromise in the uh, FCC's open internet order. They badly missed the target, in my mind. Although it paid lip service to discrimination, the kind of conduct that it focused on, namely pay for priority contracts, has nothing to do with discrimination in a classic sense. Consider this hypothetical offer by Verizon, um, in which Verizon approaches uh, uh, Sony and says, I will agree to carry your, your gaming packets uh, with, with extra special care for a price of $1,000 a month, and nothing in this contract prevents me from uh, offering the same terms to your rivals. That offer is presumptively illegal under the FCC's Open Internet Order. But because the access provider is willing to extend the, term to, the same terms to all comers, there's nothing discriminatory about it. In fact, it's not only non-discriminatory, it's efficient in the sense that two parties gain from the transaction, and there's no obvious third party who suffers. Moreover, if AT&T and Verizon could sell enough of these priority delivery contracts, they might be able to raise sufficient funds to extend their networks in a way that Bob suggested, and hopefully one day cover 100% of the country uh, with fiber. My third and final point <clears throat> is that the best way to adjudicate these discrimination complaints on the internet is through a complaint process <clears throat> and case-by-case -case determinations at the FCC. Let me give you a few benefits of this approach. The, the first one that comes to mind is that it would allow access providers to experiment with new contracts. This is, in fact, the point of, of Christopher Yu's new book. And what might that do? Well, it could encourage developers to make internet applications to take advantage of real-time delivery. We'll never get to see that now. The second benefit of this case-by-case -case approach is that it would place the burden of proof and also the burden of financing and funding litigation on the complaining party. Under the current regime, the presumption is the exact opposite. The presumption is that the contract is illegal and the burden is on the access provider, the network owner, to demonstrate that it's pro-competitive. <clears throat> we already have non-discrimination rules in the cable video space. And it seems crazy to me that we would have to invent new ones uh, as we move into the internet. For those of you who are not familiar with these protections, let me just describe quickly how they work. If an independent cable network feels that it's been discriminated against and, and it's harmed as a result, it can file a complaint with the Media Bureau. And if the Media Bureau at the FCC thinks that they've made a good case, it gets assigned to an administrative law judge. Um, you guys might be familiar with uh, a few cases, Masson versus Comcast, um, NFL versus Comcast, Tennis Channel versus Comcast, and um, I, I was the independence expert in all three cases. And as a result, I, I no longer get invited to Comcast annual Hanukkah party, although I'm trying to change that. Elizabeth is here today. Maybe she can help me out. Um, and, and, and Comcast, of course, is challenging the, the Tennis Channel decision right now in the D.C. Circuit, and I think the fate of 
of case-by-case -case determinations really hangs in the balance. Um, in fact, these cases on First Amendment grounds, um, I just want to make the final point that vertical, vertically integrated network owners should be careful about what they wish for. Because if you've got case-by-case -case determinations, the case-by-case -case protections, the Cable Act, which would presumably foreclose anything similar in the internet space, and you leave really only one of two options for policymakers. You can ignore the problems of vertical integration, which of course they would like, or at the other end of the policy spectrum, you would ban vertical integration entirely. Of course, this is what is being peddled by Tim Wu and Susan Crawford. And the folks in the middle who care about the problems of vertical integration, but who value the efficiency considerations, would be left with no viable alternative to structural separation. By advocating for a case-by-case -case approach to discrimination problems on the internet, I believe we have a solid middle ground uh, between those who argue that platform providers cannot own any content uh, and those who would ignore the vertical integration problem. We hope you will join us. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you guys for writing the book. Uh, it's an important book. It's certainly a must read for um, uh, the current commission and whoever goes there next. I, I think it's having been involved with a bunch of transitions to new commissions, I think it's really important when there is a transition to have discussions like this and books like this so that people take a deep breath and actually start to look at what's really going on. Uh, because I know that particularly like in the last year of any chairmanship, there's such momentum or they want to create such momentum about what they've done that people stop looking at what's really going on. So I think this is, it's really important to have this and, and, and uh, I'm really grateful to ITIF for having another discussion on what, what's on the agenda. Um, uh, we certainly look forward to that discussion. I also want to start by where I agree, which is with the vision, uh, which is that we, a, a policy goal ought to be faster broadband. Uh, I would actually say faster, cheaper, better, um, because I think if we have a gigabit at 7,000 bucks a month, that's not, that's not going to do us any, any good. But I, I think that's really a quibble. And certainly in a competitive market, if you have a gigabit, uh, as we saw in Austin, uh, what happened when Google announced they're offering a gig and then AT&T does it, uh, presumably the price will drop dramatically. And certainly agree with uh, removing barriers. Um, ironically, I think I'm supposed to be here to defend the FCC, um, but I think their record on improving uh, speed is in fact not very flattering. Uh, last week, I, th I think you can improve speed in three different directions, uh, from below, from above, and kind of through the middle. Uh, I gave a speech last week. Um, the FCC is very self-congratulatory on, on how they've done with universal service. I think if you actually look at the facts, they've done pretty much nothing uh, in terms of improving speed from below. It, it, is, it is a small problem in the sense of it numerically small 5%. Um, but we spent a lot of money on it, and with very little uh, to show for it, uh, despite the rhetoric that comes from them. Uh, and actually, we did a speech talking about how we drive speed from essentially from above. Um, it, I don't want to give away the bottom line, but let's just put it this way. In the great Hollywood tradition of sequels, it has a similar structure to the first speech and something of a similar conclusion. Um, uh, I certainly give them an A for rhetoric. Um, I'm actually a little sheepish about saying it because they've taken so much rhetoric from speeches I've given, for which, I don't, which I'm perfectly happy to have them do. I like that. That's per, I, I, there's no copyright. But the rhetoric is not matched by any kind of action. Uh, and I think uh, the other thing I'll say is uh, kind of in agreement, and then I'll get to the, f the fun part where I have questions. Um, the, I think what, what most of my work is about above, and USF is about below. I completely agree in the middle is very, very important. And that's really the focus of, uh, of, of where you guys are at. Uh, I'll start with a couple quick questions, uh, which I'll, you can give the, uh, quick answers to, and then I'll make some comments. First of all, if, if the government, if you knew that the government tomorrow was going to adopt all your recommendations, is corning a buy? You think it is? Yep. You think it is? I'm going to tell you why I think it's not. I think the cut, I think eighteen team Verizon and Cable are by, but but that, that that's an important distinction. Secondly, uh, one of the big questions coming up uh, on incentive auctions 
is the eligibility question. Should there be any limit on any individual company buying all of the spectrum in that auction? Um, you want to trade on all those, Blair? <laughs> yeah, just quick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we, we have, well, all, all, all that. I'll, I'll try. Do you want to take these in turn, or do you want us to know to know all? Yeah, the the only eligibility, the, the, no restrictions. The only the only restriction that we contemplate in the book is that within a given auction, right? No single bidder ought to be able to buy up all of the spectrum in a given market. Okay. But there shouldn't be a, a global spectrum cap. Got it. Uh, the, the third thing we should chat about a little bit before was: Did the DOJ air in allowing Comcast and Verizon? To have a joint venture out of region by which we they met out of the wireline region. It, it appears the DOJ analysis, and this was within the when when was this when was this link? What day you mean or what month? Uh, a year ago. It was, it was, it was you know it was yeah. not, it's fairly recent. It wasn't ten years ago. Right. Um, they allowed and correct me if I'm wrong. A joint venture of joint marketing out of uh, Verizon's wireline region. Mm -hmm. So the premise. Which I, I'm pretty sure was pushed by the parties, though the DOJ proceeding is not public. Um, the parties argued that wireless does not, well, they accepted that they couldn't do it in the wireline region, but, but they could do it where Verizon is wireless, meaning that they, don't, they weren't arguing that wireless competes with wireless. Right. And so, my, uh, my, my quick response to that is uh, I think they may have made a legal quasi political judgment about how far they could push mm -hmm. DOJ and they just decided to split the baby and say look let's just do it outside because they figured pushing the notion of wireless and wire wireline co full competition at that point probably wouldn't work um, I mean this these are litigation tactics but I think that directionally in our book we're gonna I mean clearly we're suggesting that if you look in the future they are substitutes and they are in the same market. Yeah. And so, and by the way, so if we brought up that case today or maybe two years hence, mm -hmm. it may be different because the environment would have changed. Yeah. So does your book have any evidence that they compete? Yes. I'll be interested to see it because there has been none to here too far. Well, 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 let's, let, let's get to that one quickly. Say, um, I, again, I find a lot very thought provoking in the book. I have two fundamental problems. Uh, the, the first concern I have is, well, we could argue about the individual policies, certainly happy to do that. Um, I don't believe changing the policies necessarily leads to an investment in networks and therefore doesn't necessarily lead to more speed. It could lead to investment in dividends and buybacks. I want to be clear, that's not arguing against any of these policies. It's not, I mean, and, and the heads of the companies ought to determine what to do with the capital, not the government. I'm just saying if the premise of, of the argument is change these policies and will lead to investment, you have to have to ask the investment question. Um, uh, there's a long history of companies, uh, I was just actually at a dinner with Ed Markey where he was regaling us with the many stories about the companies say, if we just get X, we will invest in fiber optic networks everywhere. Um, and you know, sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. I think after the uh, 2003 order, there was a big investment. But these are multifactorial things. Just correlation does not imply causation. I'm just saying, in my, I, I spent eight years talking to people on Wall Street. Um, I talked a lot about the open internet order and net neutrality, as, as well as these other things. And I think that um, this is a longer discussion about the economics of an upgrade. But at this moment in time, the economics are very problematic. And if you change all of these rules, you will increase margins. But in my view, you don't increase investment. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. The second problem is, even if I'm wrong, I think what it gets us is investment in what I would say is we get a B, not an A. And I think we ought to be interested in getting an A. And what I mean by that, um, you know, for example, court order and um, uh, open internet, but that affects both AT&T and Comcast equally, so that's not relevant. Even the things that are talked about that are really focused, and some of which I agree with, by the way, I, I completely agree the government owes the telephone companies a date certain at which they no longer have to invest in the old TDM networks. We can argue about when that date is, but I think the government needs to tell them uh, when that will be. 
Um, but I don't, I, I see uh, Verizon, I don't believe is ever going to expand their files footprint, unless of course there are more storms that wipe out more of the copper network, in which case they will replace that. But again, a policy to drive fiber optics through having disastrous uh, weather events is probably not the thing that we should count on. Um, I don't see AT&T um, doing that. And, I'm part, and this is actually the ironic part of the problem and why I'm, you know, I may sound a little confused, it's only because I am. What AT&T and Verizon believe is that the future is wireless, and so that's where they want to invest. And that's good, but then that gets me to my, my other concern, which is you guys believe, and I, there's reason for it, that uh, wireless should compete on equal terms in terms of uh, universal service. And I think that's fundamentally right. And in the speech I gave last week, I criticized what the FCC had done, or certainly relative to its rhetoric. There are some very good things that they did, but relative to the rhetoric, the country is not getting a fair accounting of what's going on. But they did not address what I think are two future problems. And, and this is why I think this debate is, is really valuable. And I think it's really hard. But here are the two future problems. First of all, wireless is going to wipe out the economics of a lot of the current um, recipients of universal service who have a bunch of RUS loans and things like that. That's going to be a big economic problem. And the FCC has done a very poor job of getting the country ready for that. From the consumer perspective, we may not really care, but it's going to be a big political problem. Uh, but the consumer in those rural areas will have more choices, satellite, um, uh, um, and, and, and wireless, 4G, that's great. But institutionally, what we see is even greater demands for bandwidth. So the bandwidth demands of the town hall, the fire department, the police department, the schools, uh, the small, even the small businesses, that's going up dramatically. Wireless will not do that. We, we could argue about that, and I think one of the things is, will wireless ever do it? When we did the broadband plan, our, our view at that moment in time was wireless did not compete. I think we were looking at the same data you, were, you, you, you would say. I haven't looked at the data enough recently to know, uh, but certainly from an institutional perspective. But of course, in these small towns, you've always had the whole network financed uh, with, with kind of spreading across both institutional and residential users. So that's a problem that I think is going to emerge that we haven't, um, that we really haven't looked at. And then my final point is, I think when you look at strategies that work for really faster speeds, um, what you find is not that the FCC um, is, is, you know, too, it has, has too much authority, but they're not involved at all. Everywhere in this country, where I, at least everywhere that I think is significant, whether you look at Kansas City or Chattanooga or Gig Got You stuff that I'm involved in in Seattle, Chicago, Champaign, Urbana, Research Triangle Park, um, Gainesville, and a few other players to be named later, uh, it's all about local leadership. It's all about local rules. Now, part of that actually is because low governments do affect the actual math of, of upgrades, perhaps more than the federal government. But I think it's actually also because, frankly, the, the federal government only focused on it rhetorically. And one of the interesting things at a workshop that we had um, um, was that Google actually kind of enunciated how the federal government had affected their own math, and it was only negative. And one of the, one of the things was on the program access side, which you guys have, I think, correctly pointed out is, uh, is a important concern. So um, I think it's a worthy debate. I'm actually, I'm, I think the wireless wireline thing and in its relation to universal service is one of the fundamental challenges for the next chair of the FCC. But I also think lighting the candle to really drive an upgrade, um, it's still uncertain to me, which is why I think local experimentation is very good. But I don't think the problem is that the FCC has been too regulatory. I think that they haven't done the analytic work about where they play a role and where they don't. Great. So Bob or Hal, you want to quickly respond? I got a couple yeah. things I wanted to add, and then we'll open it up. Um, do we have our pick of the <laughs> yeah. So let me take on the hardest one, this, uh, this DOJ decision. Um, and I think that uh, the luxury of time, I've come up with a way to, to, to slip out of this. Uh, so I, I do think that there is an implicit premise in the DOJ's decision that wireless and wireline don't compete, or at least at that time, wireless uh, didn't constrain. But I would be more concerned if the DOJ permitted Comcast, for example, to set the price of wireless on a standalone basis. I don't think they did that. Mm -hmm. I think what they did was they, they allow 
it, through a joint marketing, you implicitly allow Verizon and Comcast to coordinate on the price of the bundle. Mm -hmm. So we can still have substitution occurring uh, so long as Verizon is independently setting its wireless price and, and Comcast right. is independently setting uh, its, its wireline price. Um, I'm, I'm not excited about the fact they can coordinate on the bundled price because to the extent, I mean, it's conceivable they could deter substitution. It, it's, it's a weaker instrument. But I think that the, um, the DOJ was likely, uh, um, I'm sure they considered all of these things, and, and there are probably other considerations beyond just these price effects that came into play. Uh, for example, potentially efficiency arguments for, for greater, uh, greater marketing incentives. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, is, is that actually correct? I think that's right, but uh, do, do you remember? Well, it, it's essentially, a, when you look at it in pricing terms, it's a wholesale price that we're offering to them. And so we set the price for the wireless piece of it. They don't set the price of that. So just, a, just of the bundle. Yeah, for the bundle. So it's still conceivable that someone who's trying to decide between wireless or wireline will see two prices that are set by independent entities. Yeah. And that's that's what we care about, right? That, that will allow substitution. What, what the bundle might appeal more to are people, right, who see them as complements. We don't want to take the position that everyone will see them as a, as a substitute. All that matters is that enough people at the margin see them as a substitute so as to constrain uh, their prices. Go ahead, Mark. As someone who supported the deal, contrary to popular belief, um, the, the, the key to that, your question, is in the time frame of the joint venture, yeah. right? The time horizon is so short that the conclusion is that only the most absurdly myopic actor would let their long-term decisions be influenced by this short-term arrangement. And so that's the primary protection against distortion of incentives out of region. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, this works. Okay, so to address the investment question, which also touches on the whole Google thing, okay? Um, or the whole one megabit thing. So just a couple of observations. and. Uh, well, first is, uh, like you, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% committed to almost anything I say in this area because things are changing so rapidly that um, uh, this is one of the problems the SEC has to deal with and one of the sort of things that motivate us in urging that the FCC sort of voluntarily scale back is that red technology is just racing ahead. And the perfect example, actually I will take the Google thing, is that right now I don't think we all know enough that the... Uh, First, what Google's plans are, right. all right? Um, uh, you know, it, is KFC and Austin just sort of like, you know, having fun with some extra free cash? Or does Google really intend to compete with Verizon and AT&T on a nationwide footprint? I don't think anybody knows this, all right? I, I certainly don't. They do, but I don't think anybody else does. Actually, I'm not going to make Yeah, so but, that, but what that whole Google thing illustrates is just a, a great example of technological leapfrogging of, you know, here we are debating 50 and 100 megabit, and they go and do one gigabit, and right now, from everything that I've read, it's still damn expensive to do this, all right? And I, I don't know whether Google's going to make money, uh, in, you know, in Kansas City and Austin. Um, we do know that, and I was living in Kansas City until a year ago, and the Kauffman Foundation was, we think, instrumental in um, preparing a, a bid to Google with Kansas City to entice them to come. Um, and Kansas City fell over themselves to try and get Google to come. But we don't know yet if the costs justify it. Or a loop, just go out five or ten years, that has to be the future, all right? Because we know the history of this. Moore's Law is going to hit is going to hit all this. So eventually, the brands of the AT&T are going to have to go there, all right? Otherwise, Where's, the, where's their business? All right. Then, I mean, I mean you, you say, well, they can you know, buy back stock and pay dividends, but I, I think organizations that are that big do want to stay in business for their employees and, and that kind of business. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So, you know, uh, uh, and this gets to the second question. Um, let's say we do everything that Hal and I say. Um, will we get extra wireline competition, let's say, in the 50 megabit space? And then AT&T and Verizon, I can't speak for them, they have to judge the marginal gains they get by doing fixed versus wireless in that enhanced space. And, and you know, their engineers, they all tell them, and it could well be 
that they decide to hell with the fix. We'll just go wireline, and we'll go from 4G to you know 4G to 5G or whatever, and it'll be super duper. Um, and all I know is that is that if we do things in the wire line space that Hal and I do talk about, we do change the relative calculation though. We do make wireline more relatively attractive. Will it be enough for them to do it? We just don't know. But we say, look, if there's no good round, good grounds to keep them, let's just at least get rid of them and uh, let the market work because I'm not omniscient. I really don't know exactly what the right answer is. Although I do feel confident enough to say that at some point the costs are going to come down and we are going to get those liquidity split speeds. And I hope to God that the FCC is not going to screw it up and then regulate the one gigabase space and put it in sort of the old silo framework and slow that down. All right? That would that would not be good. And I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. Can I just say, I, very quickly, I, I think what AT&T and Verizon believe, and I'm, again, just kind of reflecting what my friends on Wall Street say, is their future business is wireless and enterprise. And... You know, we talk about wireless, but wireless is, there's a lot of wires in a wireless network, and so it's, it is a little bit tricky, but in terms of that kind of last hundred feet or last mile um, business, I think they believe that they can substitute a lot with wireless and that they will harvest as long as possible the existing uh, network, uh, but they're fundamentally, that that's where they make the shift. You're, you're exactly right, I think, that when... You know, we, none of us should have our feet in cement on this because tomorrow some kid in Kansas City or maybe in Austin comes up with an application that requires a gig but, like, creates huge value. Uh, when you talk about 8K television in senior centers and all kinds of uh, stuff, but lots of companies are really excited about. There's a lot of bandwidth uh, to be done, so that can change the math. You know, I love the ITIF, change the equation. Uh, that has been kind of the theme of the gig at you thing, which is to try to understand the math so as to be able to change the current unfavorable map about uh, uh, upgrades. But again, I think that's more largely at a local level that that's, that's being done. Uh, if, if I can just weigh in before we change the subject. Um, you know, AT&T did make a major announcement towards the end of last year to, yeah, in to, in, to invest in, in wireline. It's, these are their U-verse properties, and there's some kind of hybrid uh, that's right. going to get them something, you know, something faster in the direction of fiber. There's some kind of mixed strategy. Yeah. But all we can do is, as policy makers, is, is, is tinker with the, at the margins, right? Uh, with the margins, um, and, and and hope that they respond. I, I don't think that we can put a gun to their head and say that you know we'll, we'll relax this uh, perverse regulation if and only if you commit to invest. We do it, and, and we hope for the best. And the worst, you know, you suggested, what happens if uh, if they take this money? Uh, and, and instead plow it into wireless. Well, that's no reason to kick a hole in the wall. That's still investment. Oh, and it's still, I, I, competition. I, I, it's still competition against yeah. cable. So, leave it at that. Yeah. So, um, you own the mic. It's yours. I do. Thanks <laughs> for this mic. That's right. You're all ready. <laughs> right. So, just a couple of quick comments before we open it up. Um, Bob, I think I heard you say that we have um, only a intermodal competition in 50% of America. Um, I don't know, our data suggests that it's much higher than that. It's more in the 80% uh, get DSL and cable. Oh, yeah, we're, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, but even that, uh, so, so that's my I guess one, one sort of nit. But it strikes me that we don't need to have, a lot of people say we need to have two providers to each home to get competition. And I don't think that's right. You need, uh, as long as you have a pricing plan for a region that, that can't discriminate between, I know this home only gets Comcast, and so I'm going to jack up the rate, but the, this home I get Comcast and Verizon, I'm not. As long as you don't allow that sort of discrimination on the home level, and you rec have regional pricing plans, you don't need two competitors to every home. You need two competitors in every region. So I don't know if you would agree with that or... Yeah, and let me just first, the, the premise, I just want to make sure, maybe, we'll, maybe we can't even agree on the premise, but where we're getting these figures is the FCC, not in this broadband progress report, but instead in this internet updates, they put out these annual updates, and um, we're going by the speed cutoff you know, by, by which the FCC defines broadband. So when you say DSL, yes, we acknowledge DSL is basically everywhere, but DSL often doesn't meet the speed cutoff that the FCC uses to define broadband. Um, and so that, that's where we get our statistics. Um, we, we also cite to, to evidence that shows, there's a paper by, by Scott Walston that shows that when you do get a second wireline provider of, of broadband, 
vast broadband. You do see price effects. You do see quality effects. Um, uh, so, so we don't want to give up on the notion that um, that it's just that the current status is okay. We, we think the policymakers should refocus their efforts to this question: Is there a way to incentivize the telcos to push out uh, their networks? We think it'll it, it would do a lot of good. Yeah, no, I understand. I guess my question would be: Do you need that? So, so imagine a community. Yeah. So you have two communities. Community A has uh, has two providers. Um, but to, to every home except for 10%. And community B has only one provider. Uh, now I would acknowledge, I would argue that community A is going to be better, they have two providers, right. but they don't have to be to 100% of the homes to get the benefits of competition to those 10% of the homes. That's my only point. Those 10% of the homes in community A benefit from competition as long as you don't have discriminatory pricing within a region. Within a region, but you know, when I go, it's very hard for me personally, anyway, to get pricing information when I go to, a, say, a cable operator's website. You typically have to enter in an address, a physical address. So, if if they wanted to engage in, in, in discriminatory pricing at the at the neighborhood level, I don't think there's anything that, that would stop them from doing that. Well, I don't think they do. I don't think there's any. And that's my point. And I don't think it, that to me is somewhat of a speculative question, which is legitimate. I just my understanding is they don't do that. And so this notion that we have to have two pipes to every single home in a region to get the benefits of competition, I would just question that. That's all. Okay, but we don't. Um, we don't look. I think all we can agree on. I hope we can agree. It would be a better world if we just had more uh, wireline competition. We don't have to get to 100 percent. We'd just be better off if we had it. And uh, while they don't have to do it in every place, if in a few places, as a result of our policies, they they do it, we're better off. That's all. Yeah, and then, then that goes to my question. Would we be better off with two providers in high cost areas? And I, that was one thing I, I, I didn't uh -huh. hear you talk about. And my view is we wouldn't. And when you're in a high cost area, yeah. you, you really want one. You can't afford two, you can't afford three. And it's probably wireless. Yeah, it's probably wireless. But So we should be agnostic between pipe, yeah. but the idea of funding multiples, I think, is a problem anyway. Can I just get a little Bob has, like myself, disqualified himself ever to be confirmed by the United States Senate for anything. Um, by which I simply mean, um, um, not, not to be obscure about it, we will hit this moment where the rubber meets the road, I think, in approximately 2015. But that, that is just a guess. Where the rural folks realize that's actually what's happening in the marketplace, yes. that wireless is replacing wired. But what it means for a lot of rural businesses is in fact very problematic yeah. and and we do not have a we don't have a thought we don't have a plan we don't have an analysis um, for how we actually address the difference between what is fundamentally a consumer product today and what is fundamentally an institutional product so i think that's that's where the challenge will be well i guess in response to that we can go to questions yeah. i'm almost 63 and i have no desire to Go back into the government. Well, uh, <laughs> like, like not yeah. well, what do you mean an institutional product? You mean you mean a, uh, a business market, or you mean the the ILEC, the rural ILEX? No, I mean is uh, much higher speeds than and, and at a price point much different than what wireless will do. Businesses tend to use a lot more data. Schools business, use a lot more data. Market, sure. The business, but it's, it's more than just business. It's, it is also yeah, schools. Yeah, it's it's town halls. It's right. fire departments. It's, Right. You know, I, I will say wireless, hospitals, healthcare centers. Yeah. You know, back on the wireless thing, I mean, on the on the on the rural problem and the rural business. You know, you have to ask yourself. I, I, granted, that I'm not going to get confirmed. Let's just assume this. But from a, putting my economic hat on, yeah. in an age of budget austerity, which we are in, we have to ask ourselves from a national point of view: Should this be where our marginal dollars are rolling at a time when we got all these other problems in this country? My view is that if Montana wants to make a particular area, you know, a hotbed of, you know, fast app guys. Um, if they want to subsidize a wire into their place, let them do it. That's their business. But from a national point of view, given all the money that we are, are cutting from budgets, is this the highest priority that, that we ought to be doing when we're cutting kids' programs and education? And by the way, I would say transportation, which I would put at a higher level where our bridges are falling down and everything else. I think we just have to rank for our priorities. So maybe I can salvage my confirmation by saying, you know, uh, maybe our <laughs> let's, put, let's, put, let's put roads uh, in, in your place and make sure people can drive there. Well, but part of the problem I think we should just recognize is 
That's not the way the debate works. I know that. The USS is off budget. Right. No, so. Why don't we just give it all the farm subsidies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Why don't we open it up? Um, and we'll go here and then here. If you want to identify yourself first. Hi, um, Tom Risen. I'm a technology journalist. I, I was wondering, I would like to revisit your um, proposal that the FCC move to an advisory role in merge reviews. Yeah. If they became purely an advisor to the DOJ, how do you think the Department of Justice should adjust their merge review process? Okay, so um, speaking as a almost 20 year veteran of justice, um, I, I think uh, justice would welcome uh, the advice. Um, and um, uh, and by the way, we had we had a history, at least when I was there, of working with other agencies very closely. Uh, I don't think it would change the the rules, the guidelines, or any in, in in any way, shape, or form. I think DOJ would look more to the FCC for expertise on technical issues and things like that that they they wouldn't necessarily have on their staffs. And um, so I think I think it would be pretty seamless. Great, Mark. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. Let me do one thing I agree with and one thing I disagree with. Uh, with respect to the center in case by case, I'm a big advocate of that. But I want to suggest two improvements. Okay. One, the traffic flows pending the dispute. In this space, it's really important to let the innovators innovate. These are the apps guys. So they are now doing something. And the network operator says, oh, no, 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 I don't want that to happen. We have to have the traffic flowing, because that incents innovation. And two, we have to be careful about the burdens. You basically said the network operator could stop the guy, and the, the, the innovator had to show he bore the burden of proof. I think that's backwards. And so what I want to find is a way we can do case by case that incentivizes innovation. Uh, and we can, in terms of, Mm -hmm. If the traffic doesn't flow, right. you destroy the system. Can I, can I say, when, when I talked about burden, I was thinking in terms of a, of a priority delivery contract. right? So, so right now, the burden would be on the access provider to prove to the FCC that the priority delivery contract is pro-competitive. Right? It's presumptively illegal under the FCC's open internet order. Um, and, if I could flip things around, if, if I feel that you're discriminating against me by giving preferential treatment to someone, it ought to be my burden to prove that, that, that you are discriminating. Right? The current order outlines pri outlaws private line, which we learned in the telecom world, private line was the way you let the steam off for people who, who needed special treatment. But it needed, private line needs to be non-discriminatory. So I'm not disagreeing with that. But I want to go back to the fundamental proposition of how we're going to organize this space. And to me, case by case is great, but the innovator has to have the right to send traffic when we're not having this dispute. I, I hear you, and, and, and it's exactly the opposite in the video space right now. While, while vertically integrated cable operator decides not to carry you, you're, you're set out to drive. Absolutely, and it doesn't work very well. well. Uh, right. And the only thing that actually worked from the 92 Act was program access, because it gave me satellite. I mean, we go, if we go back to the early 90s, we did two opposite things in the video space. One, we created program access for satellite providers. And two, we took away program access or network access for the independent producers. We were feeling fencing. And they had exactly the expected effects. Satellite thrived and independent production disappeared. And so that's a really good lesson about access is the key to creating a, a, a dynamic space. The, the thing I want to challenge is this work. Before we do this, I just want to make it clear. It seems to me on your point there that we're talking about two different things. One is a sort of pro-network change, which is a pricing plan. So you can pay for performance. It's a pro-network uh, uh, change. And that's 100% uh, agree with, with what you're saying there. That, uh, the only nit I would have would be you, you, your point was uh, Affiliation. I don't think it's just quite affiliation. I think you have to treat equal parties equal, even if they're not affiliated. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, but generally, though, what's your incentive to, to not do so? It, usually, affiliation is going to be behind it, right? Because why would if Verizon had this offer to to Sony, why wouldn't Verizon want to extend That's it? That's fine. I just, I, I just think right? that we you should typically be affiliation right? is the cause, is the is the motivation for you it. can split the rents. Yeah, you can split the rent. But anyway, my other point. What Mark 
Mark is talking about is yeah. this negative network effect, the sort of blocking, or right. and that to me, it seems to me you could have a regime that says if you're doing the negative part, then the, the burden of proof becomes, uh, then, then it's open. If you're doing the other, the positive right. one that you're talking about, then it's a different. So, what Mark would be satisfied part. is that when the challenge, suppose you could lodge a, a challenge to some bureau, and the bureau deems that your case is worthy. And the, the, point, the flow could, could flip. start going, but the, burden, hold on, but the burden could still be on the complaining party. It seems like what would satisfy you is just that the flow resumes. It's flowing, right? that's the big threshold, is right. that the, pro, the, the, the application of the service has to be operating right, right, right. during dependency because you know what happens at the FCC. It takes you 10 years to get a decision. Yeah. In the internet space, it's gone, right? right? So the opportunity has to be real, and then we can argue about who's got to prove what, as right. long as the, uh, uh, the yes, this stuff is fine. I want to challenge the need for speed in the following sense. Um, you know, I have 500 channels in my cable network, and as far as I can tell, the last 50 megabits of the 100 megabit network has zero economic value. Today, the cable guys show me the same, they run f multiple things of constantly, right? There's zero economic value in the second 50 megabits, so who the heck needs another 900? Okay, I've got an answer to that. All right, so the best answer is that no one of us in this room really know about all the potential innovations that will happen between 50 and 100, and, and, and you know, in 1,000. All right, that extra 950 is for cloud, the guy in the garage, you know, uh, you know, streaming on, you know, beyond, beyond a 3D streaming or God knows what. I mean, it's basically opening the space to just the imagination. And I have enough faith in technological progress that people are going to figure out how to use an extra 950. Well, the point is no one's going to spend on that sort of speculation. Well, Google's spending it. Well, it's not clear whose money Google is spending. Let's be, you know, they're getting concessions. No, actually, I, I, um, I, first of all, I fundamentally agree with you, and, and this is why, from the perspective, particularly of Gig Got You, but even from the plan, the idea of going to a gig was not that we need to get it. Get it. Some people said you need to have a gig everywhere. We should be like South Korea, and we said no, that doesn't make any sense. But in the same way, from an innovation perspective, it doesn't make sense to have it nowhere. And so the idea was, how do you get a critical mass of communities? And by the way, it was in those discussions which Google kind of raised it with us, but also. In those discussions, said, you know what? Instead of just criticizing you, we should try one and we should see how it works. I think the key to Google uh, is that they it, it, they have figured out ways of lowering capex, opex, and risk rather dramatically in how they deploy. That you know the technology has actually really lowered the cost right. if you can figure out other ways, flexible regulation, stuff like that. Um, but I, 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 I agree that it, I think it's really important to give certain innovators absolute abundance, uh, unlimited bandwidth, and then the rest of the market catches up. That's the way most of the most of innovations I think occur. So I don't think the purpose of government policy ought to be to get a gig everywhere in the shortest period of time. But I do think that the government should have a policy of of driving it in a critical mass of areas. I personally think if we had three million college kids and playing with a gig within three years, uh, we'd be having a very different conversation. But that's a guess. Yeah. Other comments or questions? A like uh, couple of points on, on what uh, Blair had said. Blair on the Google thing, and I'm not criticizing their approach at all, but it was actually very uh, strategically smart. One of the reasons that they are able to deploy the way they are is that uh, they actually have a different um, policy model, too. So. The fiberhood idea, which I think is, is brilliant, basically said, look, they're going to do a survey, and if that neighborhood says they're going to do, I think it was 50%, but some target number. They were going to release the numbers, and it was yeah, different it's, it's, some number. it's a pre-commit idea. Yeah. Right. Pre-commit, and it's yeah. a brilliant idea. When we did it, we had a franchise process. We had to negotiate a lot of other things in addition to uh, entering the market, and a lot of it was usually deploying everywhere, right. uh, regardless. So that's one thing that was a big difference. On your incentives question, um, you, you know, when we announced, and you're saying it's different now, and I agree to some extent, but when we announced our uh, BIOS deployment, we actually said at the time that the policy changes the FCC adopted on unbundling uh, were a significant factor. Not the only factor, clearly, but a significant one. But today, if you look at Europe, you're seeing that, in fact, policy still does matter. I mean, the European telcos are actually valued less than many U U.S. telcos and are 
really not being able to invest because Wall Street just can't or analysts can't support it. And partly it's because of unfunding. So it still matters a lot. Well, actually, I think in Europe it, it does matter. Well, it matters here too because you just mentioned it. You said the TDM, well, we have to keep funding the TDM network versus the IP. That's the same, in some ways, the same idea. It's not unbundling, but it's still a requirement that says you have to invest in certain areas. Yeah. And it does have an effect on investment and new stuff. That's true. No question. If, if you are willing to go to my friends in Wall Street and say Verizon has a policy, or Verizon will do the following. As soon as the government tells us when we can stop investing in the TDM network, we will, we will grow the files footprint, I will say I was wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, I talk to guys there, and they just don't believe that's what you're what you would do. And so, look, every you, part of the speech I gave the other day is this kind of difference between the hedgehog and the fo uh, and, and the fox, and how different folks think of it. You know, you got to look at a lot of different data points. And part of my concern about where the FCC has been heading is they seem to be focused on branding instead of analysis. Yeah. Um, and, but I think there may well come a time where in fact policy can drive a lot of investment and we, we ought to, you know, I'll, I'll switch when the facts change. Well, one other point for how this may actually be a really part of this is really has been focused on enough. And your point about, and this is just a personal point, this is not a Verizon position statement, but <laughs> just to make that clear. Your point about offering something, uh, some kind of specialized service to somebody for $1,000 and then basically if we offer it to everybody else, there should be no problem. I think there's actually a problem with that. And I'll tell you why. If you look at the iPhone example, the reason the iPhone example is significant is that exclusivity, which many people criticize, actually encouraged to develop a new, whole new set mm -hmm. of uh, systems under the Android model. And we were actually part of that. I mean, we actually worked with Google very closely on that because it did give us an alternative. So it isn't necessarily true that that kind of model always encourages innovation. It may be that we, we will do that because everybody else is pretty much in the same place and it makes sense to do it. But there may be differences between players that say, even though you know a Yahoo and a Google has some similarities. We have a different business model with them than we do with Google. Yeah, but I was I was trying to make a slightly different point. But let me let me see if I can explain this. The 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 open internet order is so extreme that it wouldn't even permit you if you said I'll make this offer okay. available to all well, customers. That was my simple point. I mean, that's how yeah. extreme the open internet order is. Now you're asking me that kind of as long as it's based on real business. Now I think you're asking me under an ideal regime, we could start over. Would you want to allow Verizon to enter into an exclusive arrangement with Sony? That's right. a different. Yeah. That's a different question. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so, you know, if if my thing is kind of tied up with affiliation, what I what I it would be I I would I would then I think it would be very hard pressed for a, a rival to Sony to come forward and say that I'm being discriminated against, right? Um, but but I well I think there would be. I mean I think the difference. In that popular, yeah, I think the difference in that case is that the the decider, uh, if you will, in that case was the, was the phone company was the device maker, right. not the network. Mm. That's the difference. Right. The network does have oligopolistic tendencies or characteristics, I should say, and I think it just makes it different. I would be much more. I would be very concerned if you if there was a regime where a provider could say we're going to give Yahoo a really good deal, but we're going to exclude Google. Go ahead. I. You know, I'm not going to get any deal. I mean, I think we need. I think the, there's. And we've written extensively about it. those kind of deals can be very pro competition and very pro innovation. So I think we need to do those deals. I would just be worried that you could end up with exclusion. There, there. But Rob, there are other ways to do it. Is the point? So Netflix already showed that. I mean, they come up with a, a, Essentially, it's the same. It's a prioritization scheme. But they're the ones who are doing it. They're going to the carriers and saying, "Look, I've got this great CDN model. I want you guys to adopt it. You know, you don't. I don't pay anything for it." If you are willing to put my stuff in your server, I mean that—that's an alternative. I mean, it, it, it's not always true. It, it, this market is changing so much that there's a lot of ways that you can get to the same thing without the carrier being the one to do it. But the point. You, you're not excluding somebody else from coming in and posting content. No. So that's my yeah. point. And CDNs are the same thing. I mean, I, that's another alternative that Yahoo would have, like, for example, if we did a special deal with somebody else. I'm not arguing that we're going to do that. Or that's even the right policy. I'm just saying. It's changing. There's a lot of ways to do this now. They're more true. Sure. But well, there are different models than CDM to get prioritization. I mean, one of the things, when we did an event on, on network management a while back, we had a bunch of engineers, and it was really striking. Every single one of them uh, argued or, or advocated for it would be nice to be able to have network management end-to-end -end on a VOIP, video VOIP product. Mm -hmm. 
because, you know, it's not a very good experience today. And it's partly because you can't get end-to-end -end management of those bits. Um, that's not a CDM issue. That's, a, that's much more about a bit prioritization issue throughout the entire network. And again, in our view, that would be a pro-consumer kind of thing. But again, I wouldn't want to just see Skype having that and then the Google, what is Google, whatever Google's thing is, is pretty cool. Uh, Google Plus. Google Hangouts. No, there's a, there's a Google, uh, Google Hangouts. Google Hangout, yeah, video uh, hang thing, similar to Skype. Again, I think both of those, both of those wanted, both of those should be able to get it. That's, that's my other questions? Comments? Uh, uh, Mark. Well, that's, so a couple of other quick things. So for me, the issue of spectrum is not what limits you set on what any individual can, you can buy, but how much you're not going to sell and set aside for other first mile usage. So it turns out that the unlicensed model is the best example of deregulatory uh, success, and but again, it's based upon the fundamental principle of access, mm -hmm. unfettered access to a space. And as you said in your comments, as we move forward, we need more, we need to auction more spectrum. And actually, maybe we need to auction less spectrum. Of course, our license is the first mile, so you need to, I want, it's, and it's an important point, we need to really think about stimulating competition for the first mile maybe in the unlicensed space rather than the licensed space. Really important and obviously a big, a, a big public policy question. Um, I just made a very quick point about that. Um, earlier you referred to PC sales dropping, everything's moving to tablets. That's actually a phenomenon that's Wi-Fi. It's not cellular. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is again one of those challenges. I think it's really important to identify the issue of, of how you do that and also, you know, what do you do in, in this upcoming auction, all, all, of, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I think it's a big challenge because that's actually fundamentally changing uh, the nature of how we actually deliver a nomadic service as opposed to a mobile service. It turns out mobility is a more valuable functionality than bandwidth beyond the first megabit. Mobility becomes incredibly valuable. Though, though I, 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 this may sound technical, but we actually designed uh, the, the networks for mobility, by which we mean making a phone call in a car going 65 miles an hour. But the fundamental use case is it's nomadic, exactly. which is different, which is why no majority of, 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 of communication, no. even wireless, even cell phone communication, never changes a tower. Right. And and when you get to broadband, it's even the the number is even higher. And so we've designed a, a flow network when we needed a nomadic network. Right. But that's changing. The it's changing in the world. It's not changing in the cellular model. They really haven't adapted to the nomadic issue yet. And we'll see if they do. The upload is huge. That's yeah, only because they found the space there and they right. say, hey, everyone else is doing the investment. It's all, investment is entirely in... In the in the CPE, right. and they say that let's just dump it there. And if they insist on buying it all, one of the things I'm going to do first is kick them out of my Wi-Fi space. Why do they get two blocks at the spectrum? What they own or license, and what's free. So if need be, I'll make them get out of the Wi-Fi space. In which case, their costs will go through the roof because they can't provision that network. Right. But they also design sh shitty devices, right? So the receivers. Have? are not good at dealing with interference, but that was only because they didn't have to, because they had a license. Now in a world of interference, they have to be forced to build smarter receivers. Got it. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. Good. Well, look, well, this is a really great discussion, and, and um, it, it's timely, I think as Blair alluded to, that it is important. Uh, any institution, whether you're in government or not, you can focus on getting the job done and it's worthwhile stepping back and looking uh, at, at more strategic and uh, longer term issues, which is exactly what this book does. So if you haven't looked at the book or read it, I encourage you to get it. Uh, you can download it wirelessly from your uh, nomadic Wi-Fi. <laughs> so uh, a very low price. There you go. There you go. And you don't need a gigabit network to download it. No, you don't. So, uh, so please join me in thanking uh, Bob Hal and also Claire for this.